You guys, you, uh, I'm fired up to preach the word of God to you this morning right here, man. Guys, I'm excited. I'm Kenneth Cook. Sometimes they call me KC. Sometimes they call me Kenneth and KC in the same sentence. So if you're confused, that's me, amen. And so I'm excited to uh, meet together as family to get into the Bible. And, the, and, and my prayer is that as we leave this place today, we won't leave the same as we came in, amen. Well, guys, right now in our movement of churches, in our, in our family churches, right, right, right here in L.A. is a very crucial time, amen. Right now we're preparing for our uh, November love offering, amen. Yeah. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, KC. Right now we're preparing for our November love offering, amen. Yeah. Maybe I was off key right there, man. But I'm fired up, you guys are fired up. But that's going to be awesome, you guys. And it's crucial because our love offering is what's going to support the churches around the world. Yeah. Our love offering is what's going to see people one for the Lord right there. Yeah. Our love offering is going to see new people go on staff so they can be trained so this world can be evangelized in this generation. Amen. Yeah. Also, right now, the L.A. Church, we're focusing on reaching a thousand disciples by the end of the year. Amen. Yeah. That's exciting. That's, that hasn't been done right here in the, in the City of Angels Church yet. And we're fighting to make it happen by the end of the year right here. It's, if you guys use social media, which I'm sure you do because all the Marys are gone. So we got the younger crowd right here. And so I'm sharing one is social media savvy right there, man. You might have seen the hashtag, a thousand for the Lord right there, man. You guys seen the hashtag? And so those are disciples pushing to get a thousand souls added to God's kingdom by the end of this year, amen. Come on. Right now, currently, we are at 951 disciples. 49 more to go, amen. That's amazing. And so, I'm excited because here in the Central Region, we're going to be adding to that number to get us to a thousand as long as we get baptized today, amen. She's, a, she's an awesome woman. She's the, she's the mother of one of our sisters in the San Francisco church, uh, Zelma. And Zelma became a disciple almost a year ago. And she's been fighting and not giving up on her family. And today her mom will be baptized as a disciple. Amen. And so that's going to take place at uh, 630. And that's going to be at the Chapetta's house. Amen. And so, we want to get as many people as possible to go there and celebrate this amazing occasion right here, amen. Guys, so, uh, I'm excited. And so, right there, this is the battle we're fighting for. We're fighting to see people one and come to the kingdom of God and have the relationship with God God has called them to have, amen. And so, my question before you today, are you ready to fight the fight? Let's open up Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Come on, bro. Come on, Kevin. Come on, bro. 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 Come I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Amen. And the title of our lesson today is, The Time is Now. I want to start off with a quote right here from uh, Mother Teresa. She says, Yesterday is gone. Today has not yet. No, yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. We have only today. Let us begin. That's Mother Teresa right there. Amen. And so as we, get in, as we get into our study today, I, I want to prepare our hearts that the time is now. The fight is now. Like there's no time to wait. We're not waiting. We're, we're ready to fight and take this world right now today. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Haggai chapter 1. And as you turn there, Haggai right there. Yeah, it's Old Testament. Haggai is in the Old Testament. So as you look for it. I'll give you some important dates right here, alright? I got mine bookmarked, so I know where it's at. 
In 606 BC, this is uh, the first time the Israelites were taken into captivity by the Babylonians right here. Amen. And that's the first of three exiles. 606 BC is also the year that Jeremiah prophesied from saying that the Israelites would be in slavery for 70 years. 597 BC is the date of the second exile. And that's when uh, Jehoiakim was taken into exile with the Israelites. And he's, also, he's part of the bloodline of Jesus right there. 586 BC is the third exile. And that's, and that's, the, that's when Nebuchadnezzar comes into to Israel. He goes to Jerusalem. He destroys the temple of God. He tears down the wall. And literally the city is left in rubble. And there's nothing else left in the city. And everyone is taken out of the city. 536 BC, King Cyrus becomes the king of Persia. And so he makes an edict to send the Israelites back to Jerusalem. And in 536 BC, they begin to build the wall. They begin to build the temple of God. And then they start the work to get the temple built. Only for two years, though. Two years after building, they stop building the temple. 14 years go by. So from 536 to 534, they build the temple. But from 534 to 520, there's nothing happening with the temple of God as far as being built. It literally lays in ruin. And in 520, Haggai comes on the scene preaching the word of God for them to build the temple of the Lord right there. Amen. And so, that's what we pick up today in uh, Haggai chapter 1. My page turn. And so, I always, as I, as I study Haggai, I always wonder, why 70 years though? Like, that's such a long time to be in slavery though. Like God literally, Jeremiah prophesied, he says, they'll be in slavery for 70 years. Like that wasn't like a coincidence. God literally said, hey, 70 years of slavery. And say, man, what's going on? So, <clears throat> study it out right here. So what happened is, so the Israelites, was they going to the promised land, they lived in the promised land for 490 years. All right. And in the Old Covenant, in the law, it says that every seventh year is a Sabbath year. Now, what does that mean? You don't harvest the land on the Sabbath year. Because they're an agricultural uh, community, they work the land, that's how they produce. The seventh year, you give the land a break. And you just let it rejuvenate right there, man. Because working the six years in a row, that thing is beat up and tired out right there. And so, for 490 years, they never respected the Sabbath year. So, they didn't, they didn't follow God's word right there, man. And so what happens, so 490, and I don't know if there's any math majors right here. If you take 490 and you put 7 and you divide it by 7 right there, you get 70, amen? And so God said, you're not going to give me my Sabbath here when I ask for it. I'm going to take it. Wow. And so the Israelites went into slavery for 70 years because they didn't obey the word of God. Wow. <clears throat> so what does this mean? We can do it the easy way and just give God what he asked for. We can do it the hard way, and God takes what he wants. But no matter what we do, God's going to get his way, man. And so that's why it's important for us to have our priorities straight and make sure we're seeking God first, amen. Let's go to Haggai chapter 1, verse 1 right here. Verse 1, the Bible reads this. In the second... In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shehoiakim, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while the house remains in ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not worn. You earn wages only to put them in purses with holes in them. And so right here, the people, the people have like turned from God. And Haggai comes on the scene, he's preaching the message of repentance. He's trying to put a conviction in the heart of the people right here. And he says, you got to give careful thought to your ways. And for me, I, I love this passage because you know that these people was not praying to God saying the time has not come to build God's temple. That's not anyone's prayer life, right? Like no one's going to God like, hey God, right now, thank you for waking me up. But right now, we're not building your temple. 
Right now, I just want to give me a nice crib, a big flat screen TV, <laughs> nice little comfy couch, get some instant made Starbucks right there, and just have a blast, watch some music videos all day. No one's like, no one's like, thank you, bro. I can't prepare. <laughs> I knew I was going to be sweating up here, man. You got my sweat right. But So no one's praying that kind of prayer to God, right? But what happens is, God's looking at the actions of the people. Their actions are communicating a message. He knows that they're not with him because of what they're doing. And so for, for us today, I want to ask you a question. What kind of message does your life communicate to God? Their, their life communicated that the time is not now to build God's kingdom. Is that the message that your life communicates to God? Wow. Or does your life communicate that the time is now to build God's kingdom? Wow. And as we read this, I want to focus on Zerubbabel for a second. Because I want, I want, my heart is like, why did these people get here? What happened where they went back, they were fired up, they started to build a temple, and then two years later they stopped building they literally built for two years. In the book of Ezra, we won't turn there, but it says opposition and persecution arise, and these guys stopped building the temple out of fear right here. Wow. But I think another thing is the Robobel, this guy, he forgot who he was. He forgot his identity. See, Zerubbabel is the governor of Israel, but because of their sin, their governor, their, their king is a, is a Gentile king right now. But Zerubbabel, he, he's a high prestigious guy. But if you look at this passage, you won't see that from him. He's literally letting the people live and not build the temple of God right here. And this is their leader. Well, how do we know he's a, prestig a prestigious guy? Look at Matthew chapter 1. We'll go to this genealogy right here. And so when I first started studying the Bible, I always wondered why genealogy was in the Bible. <laughs> Some people with me, amen? Now, oh, amen. I always wondered, like, what, what is the purpose of this stuff? Like, I, I mean, I, I read it and... I mean, I don't have like a new conviction. I... <laughs> Amen. Jesus, David, Rahab, awesome. But now I understand the power of genealogy right here. Look at, chat, look at verse 1. It says, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So right here, as we can really read this genealogy, we see that this is the bloodline of Jesus. This is the bloodline of David, and this is the bloodline of Abraham. And so in this bloodline are people of their, descend their descendants right here. People who came after them. People who live the same bloodline as them. Look at verse 12. After the, after the exile to Babylon, Jehoanah was the father of Shehoatel. Shehoatel, the father of Zerubbabel. And so right here, we got Zerubbabel, and he's a royalty. He's, he's royalty right here. He's a guy who's not supposed to be a governor, but a guy who's supposed to be a king leading God's people. And you see right here in Haggai, this guy has forgotten who he was. He's literally forgotten his identity. He's not leading the people. He's not being the king that God called him to be. And so, if we're going to build a king, the kingdom of God, the temple of God, we got to be who God's called us to be in this kingdom right there, man. And so, I, I believe that Zerubbabel less circumstances and things going on, persecution, stop him from building the temple. And so he let circumstances determine who he was. And so for us in, in the church today, we can't let our circumstances define us. Circumstances are only meant to refine us and make us more. For Zerubbabel, his, his circumstances, they define who he was. He didn't take his lead as king. He didn't take the lead to build the temple of God. It took a prophet to come into his life, preach a powerful message to get him to change. And so if you lose yourself, you lose your mission. For me, uh, this is like crazy because I like I feel like I've been Zerubbabel before in my life. Back in Chicago, I moved here from Chicago a little over a year ago. And so back in Chicago, before I moved here, was one of the hardest times of my walk with God. And it was times where I, I didn't even want to be a disciple anymore. I literally, I was plotting, I wanted to turn my back on God. It's because I had forgotten who God called me to be. I spent about six months Literally focusing on how men thought of me, what they thought about me, if I was approved by men. I even started to compare myself to other interns in the fellowship. I was an intern in Chicago for three years, and we had multiple interns, and I would compare my life to theirs. Like, man, 
So sometimes I was, I was like, man, this guy's awesome, man. I'm nothing like this guy. And then sometimes in my anger and my bitterness, I would say, this guy's like a derelict. Why is he getting all this like recognition and all this praise? And he's able to like do get all these opportunities. And I'm getting nothing. And I literally got man focused. And as I got, as I got man focused, I began to lose my identity because now my identity was shaped by what people thought about me. And so if we let people and circumstances shape our identity, we literally lose ourselves. Guys, my question is right now, do you know who you are in Christ? Have you let circumstances, have you let people determine who you are? Or are you letting God define who you are? You know, Satan works like this, you guys. This is exactly what Satan does. He literally tries to snatch the identity of God out of our life. Yeah. If you think about it, Eve in the garden. She goes to the garden. Satan comes. Come on, one second. Wait for it. My mouth got like mad. Right. Hey, I'm ready. All right. Eve in the garden, right? We family, amen. You know. I'm trying to give it all to you. Eve's in the garden, right? And Satan comes to eat. And he says, eat this fruit from the tree. He's, she's like, no, I can't. God said no. What's up? I can't do that. <laughs> and, and Satan's like, no, nah, no, nah, listen. If you eat this, you'll be like God. And she says, hey, give me some of that. She eats it. We know that story, right? Yeah. But what's crazy, I'm like, as I'm like writing this lesson, my mind is blown. Because Satan's tricks have never changed. He told Eve, if you eat this, you'll be like God. What's crazy is she was already like God. She was created with the image of God in her. So if she was, had the image of God in her, she didn't need to be like God because she had God in her. She was already like God. So he got Eve to be insecure about who she was with God. And so she fell. And so she looked for other things to meet those, those missing parts of her life. Like, oh, I'm not like God. I need to eat this fruit. I need that. I need that wisdom. I need that. But she already had that. And for some of us right now, Satan is trying to trick us and telling us we're nothing like God right now as we sit in these seats. Satan's trying to tell us that we don't have the image of God in us. And if you believe that, you literally let Satan bring you down to a, just dust and dirt in the field right here. Because what makes us? The image of God and dirt. Satan's trying to take the image of God out of us so we can just be dirt. Wow. Nothing. And Eve allowed that to happen and Eve fell. The same trick with Jesus in, the, in uh, Luke 4. He says, if you're the son of God, turn these rocks into bread. But Jesus, you know, he says, dude, I, don't, I am the son of God. I don't need to prove anything to you. I don't need to do that. And so Jesus overcame because he knew who he was in God. And so for us, if we're battling with sin today and we can't overcome, maybe you've got to consider your ways. Wow. Look deep into your heart and look. Who you are with God. Who's God called you to be. Come on. That's right. And you can overcome anything because you have the image of God in you. Amen. Amen. And so I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to push this point home right here. With a, a quote from a famous rapper. Yeah. He's an awesome rapper. I don't support him. No, it's not Lil Pump. <laughs> or Lil Windex. <laughs> or Lil Pepsi. Or any of those other SoundCloud rappers. That's what the teens, they know what I'm talking about. But it's Drake right here. And then Drake says, know yourself, know your worth. Simple as that. If you know who you are, you know what you're worth. People who don't know who they are don't know what they're worth, and they try to find their value in other things. And that's when Satan slips in and slips us some false hope, and now we're falling down a slippery slope right there. Yeah. So I put this before you guys. I want to challenge you guys. Go and read, go and read your scriptures, study them out, and know who you are in Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's keep going. Let's look at verse 4. Okay. <clears throat> verse 4, the Bible says this. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panel houses while the house, while my house remains in ruins? 
So right here, Haggai addresses them living in a panel housing. Like this, this is basically like luxury right here, all right? That's like they're building mansions for themselves. And so this is, this is crazy because when people start to forget who they are, they start to look for comfort. And so if we're looking for comfort in our lives, it's because we've forgotten who we are with Christ. And so when we forget who we are with Christ, we lose our mission, meaning we misplace our priorities. And so we got to ask ourselves, are we living for comfort or are we living for God? Amen. And so as a result of this lifestyle of living, living for comfort, they live very unsatisfied lives. Like, look at their life. He's like, you work hard, you harvest nothing. You eat, you still hungry. That's a struggle right there. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's enough right there to make me repent. He says, you drink, you still thirsty. Wow. You know what I'm saying? You praying, and you still waiting for that interest to come through, amen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that thirst is real. No, I'm joking. He says, he says, you put on clothes, and you're still cold. He says, you, you get money only to put them in purses with holes in them. A life of an unsatisfied person right here. Nothing is fulfilling. All because you, they've forgotten who they are. And so, look at this. Look at verse, uh, let's go up right here, to verse 2. It says, these people. And so, Zerubbabel, the leader of the people, he forgot who he was. And so, what happens to the people? They are not the people of God anymore. If you look at the term, God says, these people. You know, growing up, and I know you guys probably won't believe this, but I was a problem child. All right? And I know if you know me, you're like, what in the world? How? <laughs> I got in a lot of trouble right there, man. I was still a little trouble when I got here, man, Josh. <laughs> and so, and so it's crazy because I was thinking, I was reading this passage and God says these people. And I thought about like conversations. My, my, my mom was a single mom. And my dad was, he was around. And so, because I'm a lot of people. And so uh, he was there. Somewhat, he didn't live with us, and my mom would call him up, and so I would, man, so the teacher would like, all my teachers hated me, they none of them liked me, so they would like say things about me that wasn't true, and so they'd tell, I get in trouble at school, and I'm like, man, mom, I think they're like delusional, but anyways, I get in trouble, and my mom would call my dad like, let me tell you what your son did, I'm like, your son, hey, I'm both of y'all's son, what happened, did you just disown me? Hey, excuse me. I'm right here. I can hear you. And so that what happened as a kid. She would literally say, your son, when I would do something wrong. And then when I did something good, like one time, you know, I had to step it up a little bit. Got the honor roll. They had this thing called student of the month. You take your, you take your picture in the lunchroom. I'm all sharp, too, though. I have my little suit on. I'm, I'm fired up. My mom there, I got my certificate. I'm, I don't know how I got it. I think, I, had a, I think we had like a sub for like a week, so you, amen. Anyways, but God bless me. I was a student of the month. And then my mom calls up my dad like, let me tell you about our son. Oh, now I'm y'all son. Hey, what's up with that? And so what I realized is like, when, when I do wrong, my mom kind of distances herself from me. And she says, your son. And when I do good, she's saying, our son. I think the same thing in this passage. God says, these people, not my people. And these are the people of God right here. What would God be calling you today? These people or my people? You guys, when we live for God and we work and we give our whole heart to God, God is happy to call us his kids. But when we turn our backs on God, there's a distance that happens right there, amen? And so as a result of these unsatisfying lives, as these results of lives separated from God right here, these people fall, you see their lifestyles, but and it says, basically what happens, these people fall into selfish, ambitious lives right here. And so they fall into self-pleasure. Like think about like eating and drinking. Like that's pleasurable. Like if you go out with your friends, you're going to eat and drink, right? Who doesn't go get food when they hang out? After church right now, everyone's going to go have lunch together and have a great time. So if you're, if you're a guest here today, make sure you get some lunch with some people that brought you out right there, man. But that's a pleasurable life. Right? We eat and drink. We, we eat, drink, and be merry. Amen? But these guys start living for self-pleasure. 
Then they start living for self-praise. It says you put on clothes, but you're not warm. Now, we live in Cali, so we're not really putting on clothes to be warm right there, right? Sometimes at, at night when it gets like 60 degrees and it's freezing right there. But for the most of the time, we're not. And so in our, in our culture today, we're not really putting on clothes to be warm, but more we're putting on clothes so we can be like praised. So people can say, hey, you look good. You look nice. And it feels good when you get a compliment, amen? Yeah. But we look for praise. And these people were looking for self-praise right here. And then they, look, then they, had, they wanted self-possessions, money. They started turning the money and all these different things. And so right here, these people, they literally were self-focused right here. They stopped building the temple of God because they wanted to build their own temple. And for me, this is crazy because like, when I'm not close to God, the first thing I do is start looking to build my own empire right here. Literally, I, like, I can spend a, I'll spend a whole day just looking at like, get rich quick schemes right there, man, to my shame. I had a meeting with uh, these guys from like Prime America one time. Like I was tripping, man. But I was like not focused though. I start, I literally like you guys heard of Prime. They're like, this. Yeah. amen. And so I literally like lost my focus though. And I literally started looking for money, happiness, pleasure, and I started looking to fulfill those things. Even while I'm, while I was while I was a disciple in the kingdom of God. And so the thing is, when we're not focused on God, we're focused on self. And so basically what happens is Haggai literally, he condemns these people for this lifestyle. He literally says, dude, you guys are going, you, you never, you're not going to be fulfilled. Your life is unsatisfying. Your life will not be satisfied if you don't see God with all your heart. And I look at this passage and I'm like, man, these people are crazy. You would read this and be like, they're out of their mind. But the question is, is this us? Has this become our lives? How we look to go after self-pleasure? Self-praise, self-possessions. It's nothing wrong with like working, getting a cranking job, getting your degree. I encourage every campus student here, finish school, blow it out, get straight A's, and be excellent in school right there, man. I encourage every single, if you got a job, you crank your job. You there early, you serve the most, and you become manager or whatever they got lined up for you right there, man. Because in the kingdom of God, we need to be appealing. We need to be hard workers, and we need to take care of our lives. But I want to say, if those if you're doing those things to replace God, and you're doing those things for comfort, you're in a wicked spot right there, amen? And that's, because, that's when those good things become wicked things. And so let's make sure that we're focused on God first, and we're building up God's kingdom, and not stopping to work on the temple right there, amen? Let's keep going. Let's go to Haggai uh, 1 verse 7. So after a stern re rebuke right here of the people, Haggai, he wants to give them, he wants to let them know why they were rebuked right here. Verse 7, he says this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountain and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. And so right here, the reason why God's temple is to be built is so that God can be pleased and God can be glorified. And so basically, he, they, their priorities are all jacked up. They're looking at like the world. They're trying to get satisfaction for the world. And, and he literally says, hey, you need to change your priorities to building up the kingdom of God right here. And so in the Old Testament, the purpose of the temple or the tabernacle was that God can dwell among his people. They were like, the tabernacle would be set up, the cloud would go, they would move, and God would dwell among his people. Amen? In the New Testament, the word became flesh. And he literally tabernacled among us. And we were able to see his glory right there, amen? Today, the body of Christ is the glory of God. Today, the purpose of the church is to please and glorify God still today. And so every time the temple is mentioned in the scriptures, it's followed by glory. So it's really cool because as I'm up here preaching, I'm literally looking at the glory of God in the room, amen? Amen. And so, when you think about that, we are the temple of God. Well, let's look at the scripture. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. Come on. 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 Come on.
And so God makes his dwelling as the temple meets together. As the temple of God grows, the glory of God grows. And that's why hitting a thousand disciples by the end of the year, that's not like a city of angels church thing. That's a temple, the body of God type thing right there, amen? And so it's pleasing and it glorifies God for us to build his temple. And so to build God's temple, we need all hands on deck, amen? Like we don't, we, so it's so crazy because we're, as people, we're just naturally selfish. I know I am. I hear, I hear something like, hey, we're going for a thousand, a, we're going to hit a thousand disciples by the end of the year. Amen. We're going to do it, amen. amen. That should fire you up right there. But in my selfishness, I'm like, man, I want to, I want to. I want to get like 10 of those things right there. That'd be awesome. Like I, I can think like that in my like wicked, worldly heart. And so I can get super self-driven. Like I reach out to this guy. I only talk to him. I only hang with him. I stay by with him. Someone else bring people around. And I'm like, no, I, I'm focused on my one person because I'm going to be fruitful. And that can be the heart right there. And that's a wicked heart. Because what happens is we start to think like fruitfulness is only like personal fruit. But if you know the scriptures, you know that fruit doesn't work like that, amen. amen. One reaps, another sows, one waters, all that. But if you even look in the scriptures in uh, Mark 2, there's a, there's a paralyzed man, and it takes four people to bring this guy to Christ right here. Yeah. And so for us, if we're going to go from 951 to 1,000, we got to all work together taking care of the kingdom of God, amen. amen. So what does that mean? That means you're fruitful. If you become a best friend to the person studying the Bible. That's right. One of my best friends in the kingdom of God was a guy I reached out to. His name's Brandon Trailer. He's in Chicago. I reached out to him. Joe Chappelle studies the Bible with this guy. And if you guys know Joe, Joe's like, he's hard line, right? He doesn't play. He, he raises up the flag of God right there, man. And Brandon's like, this guy is crazy. He goes, I'm like, hey, Joe wants to study with you. He's like, Man, listen, I'm not trying to hang out with Joe. Every time we get with Joe, it gets crazy, man. One time he got open, you got some telling us when you see him. He's like, man, when I was studying the Bible, I want to punch Joe. I said, dang. But that's his old life. He, he got baptized, hey, man, he's a disciple, so. But it's cool because, like, what he shared with me was, like, the reason he became a disciple because I was his best friend. He said, bro, you came to, like, the, the most, oh, man. you came to the, the hood part of Chicago to study the Bibles with me. And he's like, no one would do that. That's crazy. And so the friendship helps him become a disciple. Wow. And so if you become a best friend and someone stay in the Bible, you've been fruitful in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Also, hey, if you go get the coffee for that 1 a.m. counting the cost study right there. You know, say, for instance, say, man, I call up George. It's 1 a.m. We're recounting the cost with this guy, bro. You got to, we need coffee, man. We're like, B. George gets up out of bed. Gets dressed, goes to 7-Eleven, because that's the only thing open at that time. Gets like the 7-Eleven the coffee, which is, it's okay. Brings it to the study right there. Gives us a little boost, of, give us a little extra boost of the Holy Spirit through the coffee. And um, I don't know about you guys. But then um, with that, we able to study the Bible and get this guy to become a disciple. George has just become fruitful because he helped that happen. I think, a, I think a bigger one is like, we got a lot of Marys in our ministry. Yeah. A lot of Marys with kids, amen? Yeah. And so it's hard to be a Mary with, kid, with kids and be fruitful and fruitful labor. Mm -hmm. So I believe if someone babysits for those Mary couples, you just help become fruitful right there. Yeah. Stephanie's a single mom right here. And we want Stephanie to be in fruitful labor. Yeah. So how do we do that? We got to provide babysitting services right there so she can get out and preach the word of God right there. Yes. But we got to work together as a family in that kind of way to see fruit. We can't get self-focused on just, hey, this is my person. This is my God. This is what I'm going to do. We got to work together because as surely as we get those 51 additions, if we all self-focused and we're not pushing to, uh, to bring that unity to each other, yeah. people are leaving out the back door right there because they yeah. feel left out and not a part of the victory. Yeah. And so our goal is to bring everybody along for this awesome ride that God is about to do. Yeah. Like no one left behind. So we, we get those 51 additions, but we close the back door because we work as a team. Yeah. And so one thing you notice on Facebook, they got this hashtag, a thousand for the Lord right here. Yeah. I want to challenge all you guys to use that thing, all right? 
Like, I want to see some cranking hashtag a thousand for the Lord stories right there. Yeah, yeah. Like, I want to see, hey, listen, 3 a.m., grabbing the coffee for a Bible study, that counting the cost with, with John. Pray for him. He's going to get baptized tomorrow. I just got the coffee. Hashtag a thousand for the Lord. And I'm fired up right there. When I wake up the next morning and read it. So I'm fired up. <laughs> or, or, hey, I just watched Phoenix, Phoenix and, Ke and Ken Kingston for the, for the Smiths. So they can study the Bible and be fruitful. Hashtag a thousand for the Lord right there. Like that's the kind of community and family we got to build in the kingdom of God right there. Amen. And so it takes four things to have this kind of mentality. It's also in Haggai. Look at verse 12. Come on, Katie. Let's go, bro. Let's go back to Haggai chapter 1. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. <laughs> Verse 12, it says this. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shehoatel, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God has sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the people stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shehoatel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began the work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. And so right here we see the four things it takes to get the ball rolling right here. In verse 12, they followed the word of the Lord right there. So if we're going to build up God's kingdom, we're going to build up God's church, we got to obey God's word. Amen. amen. And so we got to be having cranking times with the Lord. Amen. amen. How was your time with God this morning? Awesome. And this is and this is how we're going to know who God is. And most important, this is how we're going to know who we are. Yeah. Zerubbabel stopped listening to the word of the Lord. And so someone destined to be a king was downsized to a governor. If we're not listening to the word of the Lord, we're not going to reach our max potential in God right there. Wow. Verse 13, it says, this is what Haggai, the, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the Lord's people. I am with you, declares the Lord. The second thing we need is the worship of God. Amen. God says, I'm with you. They had a reverence for God. They listened to the message. They obeyed the message. And God was with them. We got to have powerful prayer lives. Yeah. Powerful lives of worship to God. Like we got to cry out. Like the, our prayer lives is the difference between real faith and wishful thinking. Yeah. And that can easily be confused. Trust me. Yeah. It's so easy to confuse comfort and faith. Yeah. It's so easy to confuse wishful thinking and faith. Yeah. Well, I, I give you the solution right here. If you're not praying, you're just a wishful thinker. Wow. If you're not crying out for these things, you're just comfortable. Like, you're, if you're relying on your own strength, it's because you're comfortable. You think you can handle it. And so our, our life praising God, our faith is shown through our prayer life right there. Yeah. Our worship of God. And so we got to be people who pray. As, uh, as John Kazi would say right here, we got to move God to move the ministry. Amen. Come on. Come on, and then the third thing is the spirit of God. Verse 14. It reads this. The high, wait, uh, it says the high priest in the spirit of the whole remnant. I'm sorry, verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shehoiakim, governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, and the spirit of all the people in the remnant right there. And it says the spirit of the. It says the Lord stirred up their spirits. In Romans three sixteen, we know that the way that God moves our spirit is He speaks with His spirit to our spirit. And so the spirit of the Lord was with them because they got into the Word of God. And they had praise to God. And now the spirit of God was able to move them and direct them. Amen. You know, we can't do God's work if we don't have the spirit of God in us. Yeah. Just, just how does that even work? Just think about like, you're going to do the work of McDonald's, but you work for Burger King. Does that make sense? No. You can't do the work of God if you don't have the spirit of God working in your heart right here. And so the spirit of God is only moved in us through our prayer lives. Amen. Yeah. And then the fourth thing here is the people of God. And it says they got to work. We can't move this ministry by ourselves. 
We can't move to a thousand if it's just us alone. We literally have to work together and get the people of God engaged in working together to build the kingdom of God. Amen. And so let's close out right here. Let's go to Haggai chapter 2, verse 23. Last verse of Haggai. And so in 520, Haggai preaches the word. 514, the kingdom of 516, the temple is actually built and back working and functioning properly right here. So an event that took Literally, if you check the time of how long it took to build this temple, it was only six years of work. Wow. But it took them 16 years because of their lack of faith and obedience to God. Yeah. Don't, don't let your faithlessness stop God from working a miracle in your life. Yeah. Don't let your lack of obedience hold God back from working powerfully right away. In verse 23, we'll close out here. It says... On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take my servants of Rubbabel, son of Shehoatel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. So right here is you get a powerful scripture. The guy, you get a guy like Zerubbabel who, who forgot who he was in the beginning, and because he turned, he gave his whole heart to God, he followed the word of God, he got the, the other people in his life working with him to build God's temple, and he praised God. God says he went from a governor to a signet ring for God. Wow. A signet ring is super important. This is what the king wears to show honor and authority. Yeah. This is in, uh, the, in the book of Daniel, when they throw Daniel in the lion's den, he locks the lion's den with a signet ring. Wow. This is his authority. And so right here, Zerubbabel went from a man who didn't know who he was to becoming the authority of God. Wow. And so for us guys, we got to get close to God. We got to get in our words right here. We got to praise God in our prayer life. We got to work together as the body of Christ to see a thousand one for the Lord. Amen. And we will become signet rings for the Lord. An honor and power for our God. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen.